every time I've seen him, he's always been cross-legged. He's got a grayish, he looks like he's a corpse. It looks like a corpse. And he's got a grayish uh, tone to him, and he's wearing a red flannel shirt, and he's... he's okay. What's wrong? What happened? I told you, get down, get, get down! down. One of the most and rare ghost stories that took place over roughly three years is one of Jackie Hernandez's experience. She claims to have been haunted by two violent ghosts that span over multiple homes, even though they were miles apart. Jackie Hernandez was a woman haunted by two violent ghosts and each with its own reason for causing trouble in Jackie's life. Jackie's haunting story is scarier than any ghost story made up around a campfire. So get ready to sleep with the lights on tonight. When I moved in, I didn't believe it was haunted. I didn't think of that. I felt a presence around the house and I was wondering why I had some of the feelings that I was having, but there was no activity happening or I didn't witness anything so I just didn't think that it was haunted. In the winter of 1988, Jackie Hernandez, age 23 at the time, was pregnant with her second child. But at the same time, she was also dealing with a rocky marriage. She left her husband and moved with her two-year-old son, Jamie. She moved into a turn-of-the-century bungalow in San Pedro. Combined with all the stress from her daily life, can be a magnet for paranormal activity. More and more things started happening. I, rem I was pregnant at the time with my daughter, and um, I frequently had to use the restroom at night. I always woke up once a night. That's when I saw the apparition sitting on the bunk beds uh, twice. He, he was very um, grayish in appearance, and his, he looked as if he was very angry and evil at the same time, which made me feel uneasy. It wasn't like a friendly, um, welcoming type of thing. It was like he was very angry. And then little by little, um, more and more things started happening. I, rem I was pregnant at the time with my daughter, and... Um, I frequently had to use the restroom at night. I always woke up once a night. But the strange thing about that was I always woke up at midnight. I always, regardless what time I went to sleep at night. If I went to sleep at 7, I'd wake up at midnight to go to the bathroom. If I woke up at, at uh, 11, or if I went to sleep at uh, 11, I'd wake up at midnight. It didn't matter the time. It was always at midnight. And usually when, at that time, something would happen. I remember um, one time I woke up and all the window shades in the house, we had shades and not curtains, they all went up sim spontaneously at all the same time, really hard, and that freaked me out. That's when I saw the apparition sitting on the bunk beds uh, twice. Um, my son and I, we didn't sleep in the, in the bedroom. We had the, the bedroom was set up for the kids. I had a crib in there and a bunk bed for him, but he slept in the front room with me and I didn't have a bed at the time. Uh, we were sleeping on a mattress on the floor and um, I had a cat. Uh, at the time too that I just recently got and the cat was like a really mellow mellow cat but when it got into the house it was it was strange it acted really peculiar it, it would chase the shadow around the house and it would um it would it, at times when it was it would it would uh just act a a abnormal it would follow the lights it would chase the shadows it would um arch its back like cats do when they're really afraid of something it wouldn't go outside uh, of the house, but it wouldn't come back in once it was outside either. You could tell when animals sent something like that. They they really they uh, did. But you know, after that, after Al moved in, he only stayed a week before I kicked him out, and then that's when things started happening. And my friends started witnessing things also. When she told her ex-husband Al all about her experiences, Al suggested that she should call the spirits out. So that's what he did. 
and Al pretty much said, if there's anyone here, show yourself now and prove it. And they waited eagerly for something to happen. Then nothing. I was just thinking that Jackie was just seeking attention because she was lonely. And as soon as Jackie's ex-husband left, she went to go open her closet door and that is when she seen in red and blue crayons from top to bottom of her closet that something or someone had written OW in crayon all over the closet. That was the paranormal's entity of accepting Al's answer to the challenge. But by this point, Al was long gone. The attic door was, was directly above in the laundry room, so I stood on the washing machine and I opened the trap door and I was looking around and I remember feeling these eyes looking at me. It was as if somebody was right behind me just looking right at me. And I turned around and I didn't see anything. Now the attic was, was empty and it was dark and you couldn't see anything really. And I turned around again because I, would, I got this very uncomfortable feeling that something was definitely there and looking right at me. And as I looked uh, towards the far side of the attic, this head, it was, it was like, it was, it was a chubby man and the head started at the far side of the attic and came directly at me with, a, I didn't even have time to, to think about my reaction. My legs just gave out from underneath me. I was so scared. She felt something in that house until it really started showing itself to her until it showed itself to me. One day, Jackie and her friend, Susan, were out for a walk and they just happened to run into Jackie's landlord. Susan spoke up and told Jackie's landlord what was going on. And his idea was to bring in some priest to exercise the spirits. At this point, Jackie was ready to try anything and thought that that was a good idea to have a priest over. The next day, Jackie had a knock on her door and it was the priest from a local church. The ministers didn't assist by any stretch of the imagination. They looked at her condo and announced that rather than Jackie's house being haunted, she was possessed by the devil. The day after the clerics left, Child's Protective Services made an appearance to check whether Jackie was using some kind of drugs. Evidently, the priest had called Child's Protective Services since they thought she was utilizing some kind of stimulants while pregnant. Now Jackie felt trapped and was not going to discuss this anymore with no one. Then Jackie claims that a blood-like substance started coming from everywhere in the home. From that day on, she would regularly have to clean up puddles of blood-like fluid when she was in the kitchen. Jackie likewise guarantees that around this time she started to see objects flying across the room and she felt like she was losing her mind at this point. She felt like her and her family were being focused on by an unpredictable power and she didn't have the foggiest idea who to go to or where to go from here. Jackie's friend Susan proposed that she reach out to a paranormal specialist named Barry Taft. More than 2,300 uh, cases that I personally investigated in the last 24 years, uh, we were able to actually record phenomena and document it in real time on videotape. Analysis of the first, um, I guess, liquid was that it was human blood mixed with iodine, high copper co content. It was human male blood. When the investigative team came, um, Barry Taft arrived first 
and I began telling him the things that were, the things that were happening around the house. And shortly after that is when Barry Conrad and Jeff came, and they knocked on the door, and I was sitting on the couch, and I just said, "Come in." Barry Conrad was the first to come in, and he had this look on his face like a kid at Christmas time. I mean, like he was gonna open up a present, like you know, he was really looking forward to possibly seeing something. Well, Jeff comes in. And you could tell that he was very, very skeptical. All, and he had, he almost was like he didn't even want to be there at that time. He would rather have been any place else but there. But um, that's that's what I sensed from him anyway. When they started going around, after I told them a few more things and answered a few more questions, they s started going around the house and each doing their own thing. Jeff taking pictures of different things around the house and different spots that. We, that I had told him where things had, had happened. And he went up into the attic or he stood on the washing machine because of the what I said about the disembodied head and my experience of that. All Everybody was in their own separate little groups. There was a couple groups of a couple people just talking. And I was talking to Larry Brooks, who was an artist who was drawing pictures of certain things around the house. And Jeff came down out of the attic and Larry Brooks asked him, what he, if he felt anything up there and he described a feeling of being watched from behind something looking at him and I, I instantly could relate to what he what he felt because I felt it the same thing myself when I was up there before I saw the head and she, Larry Brooks said well asked him if he would go my what he would think about going back up into the attic and taking shots with his camera over his shoulder it was, um, he went back up into the attic to take shots in hopes of catching something behind him and he was just going to take shots with the camera over his shoulder. Jackie Hernandez had told us about the disembodied head in the attic. I just wanted to go up to see if I could see anything at all. I took some photos the first time I went up upstairs. Now these photos were taken like I would normally take photos just straight on, straight ahead. I went downstairs and we were talking downstairs for a while and one of the gentlemen, I think it was Barry Taft, said, why don't you take some photos behind you? With, in other words, with the lens behind you. So I figured, okay, let's, let's try that. I went upstairs. I started clicking off some photos. It was dark, totally dark. So it was like a time exposure thing. Uh, I fired first, second, and just as I fired into the third frame, something pulled this camera from my hands. I had it over my shoulder like this, firing. Something just pulled the whole camera out. Then, at that particular moment, I went downstairs just as fast as you could imagine. It's just like someone would take the lens barrel of the camera and grab a hold of it and just pull it out. That's how it felt. That's exactly how it felt. I was shocked at that point. I went downstairs immediately. And then oh, you know how you get your adrenaline up. I'm down there and I'm thinking, expensive camera. I'm going back up to get this thing. That's kind of the first thing I thought, you know. I go back up there with lights this time, with a flashlight. I don't see my camera in the position that I was. I look back in the corner. All of a sudden, I see just the lens sitting there in the corner of the attic and I'm looking around in the corner in the other corner of the attic 15 feet away 15 or 20 feet away I don't remember exactly was the body of the camera lying upside down with the lens port the lens port laying straight down into a box you know one of those boxes of grapes or uh, cherries you know just an old crate that was in the attic the camera was upside down lens port down laying inside that box and the lens was over 15 feet away. It had, whatever had taken this from my hands had separated the, the lens from the body of the camera. And now that's no easy feat really because you have to know about cameras, a little bit about cameras. There has to be some knowledge there because you can't just pull it off. It was actually removed, taken off. There's a friction mount lock, it's a Canon lens, and it's got a friction mount. In other words, you put the lens on and you turn the lock in position. 
So whatever had taken this from my hands had turned that lock and removed the lens from the camera, separated it from the camera, if you will, and placed the lens in one corner and the body carefully in the other corner of the attic. Now talk about your first fright right there. I knew there had to be something. There had to be something in that attic to do that. Barry Conrad and I went up into the attic a little bit later that evening. We had some lights set up and we were going to do some videotaping just just to be taping some stuff up there just just to document what the attic actually looked like. When Barry Conrad went up with Jeff into the attic that night, um, a couple things had happened. First, his camera uh, would die as soon as he went up into the attic. You'd, uh, it would just quit. But when he brought it down, it would work. It was as if it was just some kind of power thing. It wouldn't work up there, but it would work down below. And the other thing that happened was we hear Jeff yell again, and apparently, right in front of Barry Conrad, Jeff was pushed by this thing. And I felt this force pushing my back, like, like a huge hand just pushing, pushing, pushing my back. I witnessed it, right? And you were right there. I couldn't see what was pushing him, although I looked. We had a, a thousand watt light, which is about, I would say, probably to my right, somewhere right in this area. And again, I could relate to what he felt at that time with the hand because I felt that it's pushed me a couple times previously. All of a sudden I feel this pushing on my back like a pressure and it's getting harder and harder and Barry's looking up at me and wondering what am I doing you know I mean I have this strange face and all of a sudden I'm being pushed forward and forward and forward and it was felt like it felt like a hand like a huge hand like a bony hand was pushing me on my back. And I went down and down and down and here I'm just like, I can't believe this. And I, I didn't dare look behind me. I was frightened at that point and I didn't dare look behind me. But here Barry's looking at me and wondering what in the world is going on. I remember when they both came down from the attic, it was, um, they had also seen, Jeff had also seen lights in the attic zoom by, which was something, another thing that I have also witnessed in the house prior to their, uh, to August 8th. But it seemed to be that he was the only one that it was focused on, that he was the only one that actually saw things. And he actually got a still shot of one of the lights that was, uh, zooming by. And he also saw a giant shadow. Uh, everybody said that, that they, the odor was very strong and everybody could smell it and it was actually bothering some of them. And the whole feeling of the room just changed. It was, it went from all of a sudden from being just an interview to something that was actually happening. I mean, this, this was actually happening and nobody could explain it. And it, everybody was very scared. The looks on their faces, you just didn't know what was happening next. Um, everybody was in the kitchen. We were all congregated, one, you know, talking, discussing the events and then something started walking in the attic. Nobody was up there at that time. We're in the kitchen. We're just sitting there talking. All of a sudden we hear these heavy footsteps. Boom, 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 boom. We thought it was outdoors at first, but then if you listen carefully, it was directly above us. So I got up on the wash machine, looked up into the attic, and as soon as I looked up into the attic, first, first before I say that, I should say, that we didn't have any lights in the attic at that point. The only light in the attic would be some of the light that's bouncing from the, the rooms itself up into the attic itself. So I'm looking up, I, I get on top of the wash machine, I'm looking up into the attic, and I see three flashes of light. First there's one, boom, second, boom, probably about the size of a coffee can lid in size, I would say, just to be guessing, probably 15 feet away from me. Bright flashes of light. And then the third flash of light was about the size of a basketball. It was larger than the other two. Now I know flashes of light pretty well because I'm a photographer. So I would say it was like boom, boom, and boom. The flashes were like a flash, but they were slow, like maybe an eighth of a second or a tenth of a second, something like that. 
very slow, nothing real fast. Then, after the three flashes of light, I'm thinking, maybe, is there, maybe I'll see something more. All of a sudden, it's dark, and I see a black mass moving in the attic. It's like you would take three men and cover them with black velvet, big, huge black velvet cloth, and it's just like that. It moved slowly across the attic, and then just like it dissipated. I could see it enough because there was enough light being reflected up into the attic, so I know that it was something black that was moving. I remember we went in to do a last interview, and they were, we had the camera all set up, and the lights, and the light came on and off. Tap and the group decided to do another short interview with Jackie. Just before they were getting ready to leave Jackie's home. That very evening, the situation spun out of control in Jackie's home. Jackie was assaulted. She promptly called Barry and his group for help. Ah! I'm not staying here, Barry. I'm out of here. I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here. Oh, is there, we're coming right now. Okay, hurry, hurry, please, hurry, please. I don't know how long I can stay here. We're leaving right now. After Jackie called him in a dismay, Taft immediately called his group and returned to Jackie's home. He asked what had happened. She said, well, she'd been hit by a can of Coke or something and had flown across the room and hit her in the back. And that's why she'd stopped talking because she'd stopped talking for uh, whatever a few seconds there. We're like, you know, well, what happened? What's going on? And she came back to the phone and explained that something had hit her in the back, flown across the room and it was a can of Coke or something had hit her in the back. So things were flying off the shelves and off the tables and, and hitting her as we were talking to her on the phone. It was yelling for us to get down there. She had to leave. She wanted to get out of there. She wanted us to come down because she was just really, uh, really frightened to know what was going on and, and basically wanted to get out of there. I think it was a couple of weeks later, actually, um, at, here at Barry Conrad's studio here in Studio City. A friend of ours was with us, Gary Bain. We receive a frantic call from Jackie Hernandez down in San Pedro and she is in trouble. There's things being thrown at her. Uh, they're seeing all kinds of strange lights. All hell is breaking loose. So I tell Barry right away, I said, let's load up the equipment and go down there. Now, people are probably going to wonder, why would I want to go down there a second time? Well, once you start on a case like this, you want to follow through and see what you can learn. I was that excited about the case, actually, that we took off, went down there, and uh, I was a little bit uneasy about going in the house and even probably more uneasy about going up in the attic again, but I knew that we had to go up there just to see what was going on. Maybe I could capture some more lights, whatever. We're walking around the attic, looking around just to check to see if there's anything unusual, if there's anything being that had been moved uh, or displaced, anything like that. We're walking around looking and uh, Barry Conrad is down below downstairs and uh, Gary Bain goes near the attic opening and he's talking with Barry Conrad and Barry says something like I think there's some things going on down here so I looked at, at Gary and I says well you know there's not much happening up here Let's go downstairs. The only thing we took with us was a flashlight and a very small camera, just a, like an enzymatic type small camera. And uh, uh, Jeff had the flashlight and I had the camera, just as it happened. So when I turned and walked away from him, I, you know, I could see because he had the flashlight on and I could see, you know, certainly the opening that I was walking towards. But uh, as I approached the opening, and you see that in the, in the videotape that uh, Barry Conrad was shooting at that point. Uh, you can just see when I just got up to the opening, and that was the point that Jeff yelled out, and when he did, he dropped the flashlight. So if you can just kind of picture what was happening there, we had at least the light of the flashlight and the light coming up from the opening, and as soon as he dropped the flashlight, the attic went dark. So you see me approach the opening, I had the camera in my hand, just kind of loosely holding it. I wasn't planning on taking any pictures or anything at that point. I was just looking down into the opening to see why everyone was yelling downstairs. And I look to Gary and I say, I don't think there's much happening up here at all. Let's go downstairs. At the moment I said that, I took one step. And that's all I remember. And at that point, Jeff uh, dropped the flashlight, he yelled out. What's wrong? What happened? And 
I turned around to see now, you know, why was he yelling? <laughs> so, you know, what was going on? It was very stirred up. Al never came out of the bedroom. The kids were in the bedroom the whole time. Another thing that did happen that that happened directly to Al, and it was the only experience he's ever had except for the, when he witnessed a few things falling when he first moved in, was that he claimed that a voice had spoken to him out of the clear blue um, when he was watching TV in there. And he said that the voice was so plain that he actually he actually responded to it. It said, get them the get them the hell out of here, get them the fuck out of here. And he said he actually turned his, because it was so clear, it was just like somebody was right there talking to him. He said I, his first response was, I can't, it's not my house. I can't get them out. He said as soon as he thought that and realized nobody was there, that's when Jeff screamed the first time when the camera got removed from his hands. I told you, get down, get, get down. down. So uh, uh, the first thing that I could see in looking back towards him was that uh, from just what little light was coming up from the opening, he was wearing a white shirt, but I could see that he wasn't standing up straight. That for some reason, this the image of the just dim view of this white shirt was that he was about on a 45 degree angle. He was not standing up straight, which immediately struck me as odd besides the fact that he just yelled out and dropped the flashlight. Until Gary's looking me right in the face and for some strange reason, I'm pulled over to the side of the attic. There's something around my neck. I don't know what it is. And he helps me off of this nail whatever is around my neck is hooked on a nail I was pulled over to the side of the attic I don't remember for the, there's a, a space of time in there that I lost everything went black I don't be, remember being lifted up there but I was actually hung I was hung in an attic and as it turns out there was a clothesline around my neck when we went downstairs later uh, I remember seeing the red marks on my neck it was actually around my neck that tight Gary took a picture. He actually took a, had enough time to take a photo of me before he took me down. He had a point-and-shoot camera with him. Uh, one of the questions that I get asked the most is, is, you know, it's like, well, why did I take a picture? You know, why didn't I run to help him or see what was going on or whatever? And the reason was, as I said, when he dropped the flashlight, the attic went dark, so I couldn't see. So I had this camera in my hand, so my first reaction was simply to raise the camera and take a photograph of why was he on this 45 degree angle I couldn't see anyway kind of thing. And, uh, and then I could see that what was, uh, as you see in one of the photographs there, he was wrapped around one of these boards that was coming down on an angle from the ceiling, and he was like holding onto this thing for dear life, but yet there was absolutely no expression on his face, it was like completely blank. So obviously I knew there was something you know, wrong or something had happened to him. And I jumped up and I had to take about one step forward and then turn to the left to go back down through the center of the attic. And once again, I realized I couldn't see because at that point I was walking away from the light. And again, I was saying, you know, why'd you take all these pictures? Well, once again, I could not see. The only source of light that I had was the flash from the camera in my hand. So I took a second picture as I was about halfway to him because I didn't want to trip over the loose boards and things that were there at the, at the bottom of the attic exactly at the same time that I took the flash picture because I never could figure out why we couldn't see when I took the flash picture on the tape that he had taken and finally came to realize that it was at the exact same instant when he flicked on that light is when the flash occurred from taking the photograph of the first one and then the second one I took you know on the way going to Jeff because once again since he dropped the flashlight you know, we only had one flashlight between the two of us and he dropped the flashlight so that's why I couldn't see you to get over to him uh, until I took a second picture to make sure I wasn't going to trip over something And you know, the funny thing about that is there was nothing on that attic floor at all. We had examined every square inch of that attic floor. There was nothing like a piece of rope or twine or clothesline on that floor. That's what was really strange. No way that Gary could have done anything to cause Jeff to be hung in the attic or played any kind of trick on him because he was... We were, he was in the attic door. We were talking to him as when Jeff, when the actual hanging occurred, and he was right there within our plain sight, so there was nothing he could have done. And the timing was, uh, there's no way that Jeff could have done it himself because he was only away from Gary for a few seconds. And there's no, there's no possible way that either one of them could have um, faked that hanging or caused that hanging to have happened. There's been less than a handful of people that have been de deliberately harmed or injured in some way by this phenomena. 
In fact, only one really well-established case. So this might be the second one. And if it was not for one of our other associates present in the attic, Jeff might have been killed. I mean, here you try to rationalize, you know, what has happened, actually? I'm here, I'm pulled to the side of the attic, and there's nobody up there, and I know that Gary's standing there, and, you know, he has nothing to do with it. He's at a distance from me. I see the flash from his camera. I remember that. And I know he said something to me, but I don't recall exactly what he said. But here I try to rationalize this in my mind, and I just can't do it. Front door, and she was in a carrier, and she was wide awake. And it seemed, Sue was the first one to notice it. I had passed Samantha seconds before and nothing was on, she was fine. Then Sue passed and she noticed that there was a red mark on the baby's forehead. And she asked about it and that's when I, I noticed it and it wasn't on seconds ago. And it was, it freaked me out because it came so close to my kids. And it was almost as if it was saying to me, hey, I can do what I want to. Don't tell me that not to mess with your kids, because if I want to, I will. I can do anything I want. I don't know. Look at what's on the baby. Come on, you guys, let's go. Something that, that hurt her in any way. Um, she didn't even realize what had happened, I don't think. She, was, she didn't make a peep. It was just... The, it was, the material that was used was kind of like a lipstick or a grease paint, and it was just a slash across her head. And I had the same thought uh, as when the blood came out of the walls, is just get it off of her as quick as possible, because to me, that was part of it on my daughter, and I did not want that on her at all. Hey, this is Jackie. It's uh, 10.30 Monday morning. Uh, I got a picture of it. I think I got about three or four good shots of it. It's going around on the kitchen ceiling, and there's a light film of smoke up there, and I don't know where the smoke is coming from, but I got the lights that have been zooming around. There's been light beams that on the, dancing around on the ceiling, and then there was also a shape form. I was afraid <laughs> to go back to the house. Jackie and Al moved into a trailer in Weldon, California. In about two or three weeks, she began to feel great in her new home. Jackie felt that everything was going to be all right. Not very long after Jackie moved into her new residence, Jackie and her spouse, Al, split up once more. Then, at that point, something occurred in the shed that demonstrated it was not only the house in San Pedro that was haunted. One of Jackie's neighbors was helping by moving an extra large television out of Jackie's shed out back of her new home. That is the point at which Jackie's companion seen a glaring face of a withered elderly spirit. I know that it is following me. Um, I don't know that it's following me every single place I go or every errand I run, but I do have a, a feeling now that it is here. That, that was the thing that got me was the eyes. It's just all of a sudden the face was real clear that I could see from the opposite end of the TV. And it was just real clear, but his eyes were just staring straight at me and he was just real, like you said, evil looking. These eyes were evil. That's all you could say. From that day on, from that face, since we saw it in the TV, you just get this feeling when you walk over here. You can just feel the presence of something here. I don't know what it is, but there is definitely something here. That very evening, she says that she heard somebody beating within the shed, wanting to get out. With no one other person to go to, Jackie called Taft and his group to check out whether they could help her once again. When I first set it up, I framed it directly inside of the shed. We set it up on a tripod, we walked away from it, we came in the house. After we were in the house, uh, oh, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was, we were looking out the window and it appeared to me like the camera was panned there is. Towards, towards us, us, which meant that it would have to be panned towards the left. Well, I remember locking the camera down. It's got two locks on it, friction mount locks. And I locked them both down. There's no way that thing could be moved, you know, unless it was forced in some manner. None of their electronic gear, cameras, 
heat sensors and so forth would turn on. And if a gadget would cooperate, it wouldn't remain on for very long. So they decided to use unconventional ways to try to communicate with the spirits. Jackie kept a handwritten transcript of the events and the questions that they asked the ghost. Jackie asserted that the apparition told her that he had been suffocated in the San Pedro Inlet in 1930 and that his killer resided in her old house. He likewise told her that there were more spirits staying there also. If that weren't enough, the ghost claimed that it had tried to hang a member of Barry's crew, Jeff Wheatcraft, because he looked like his murderer. We were sitting in Weldon at a table with a Ouija board on the table, and we're playing this thing. And this is the last major incident that really happened to me. We're playing this thing, and we're asking it questions. And all of a sudden, it hit me so hard, it picked me up out of a chair. Barry Conrad, the cameraman, is sitting right across from me. If we'd only had this thing on tape, but there again, this was another incident where it killed a video camera, and we also had a backup audio cassette recorder trying to record the sound portion of what was going on, and we play this back and there's like nothing on it. But anyway, getting back to the size of this thing, the immensity of this thing. This is what really hit me at this point. I felt like I was hit by a huge boxing glove. That's exactly what it felt like. I'm sitting in this chair at this table, if you can imagine, playing this Ouija board. All of a sudden, it felt like something was coming up right here at this point and striking me, lifting me up out of the chair and throwing me against the trailer wall. This is a small trailer, but I, when I hit that wall, I could just feel the trailer give. So I knew I hit this thing really strong. I know I had to get out of the trailer quickly. I left the trailer. I got out of there. But the strange thing about this whole thing is once I was outside the trailer, it felt like there was something that was compelling me to go back in there. I don't know what it was. But I felt like, I mean, everybody else was, was, was even telling me, you know, you look strange. There's something weird about you. But you, and I felt like, I kept looking at the trailer and I felt like, I have to get back in there. I have to get back in there. And I'm not sure why. But I felt compelled to get back in there for some reason. Once we got back in the trailer, it seemed like I was okay for a while. And the place was real cold. And it was so cold in that trailer that we had to light a fire. And we stayed there all night, of course. But uh, it was freezing cold in that place. I met Jackie. She moved in next door to us. And she started asking if I could babysit for her kids. And I said, yeah. So I used to babysit for her. And some of my neighbors behind me started telling me that there was things going on in her house. And I said, I'm over there all, all the time. There's nothing going on. And then <laughs> things started happening in front of me. So I went over there mostly for support of her because I didn't want her to be by herself. And she wouldn't leave. She wasn't willing to give in to the ghost. So I seen a face burned into a, a bedspread while we were sitting in the living room. Um, we used to be walking down the hall and we'd see red slashes go across the wall. And she'd just paint over them like it was going to fix it. So it would start doing it more. And it'd spell Jackie on the wall in red. And she'd just paint over it. And I seen <clears throat> lights going across the kitchen ceiling. I seen um, a skull through a camera lens. When she kept telling me to take pictures and the camera wouldn't work. So I um, pointed out the window where there was nothing that I could capture as far as the ghost was concerned. And I seen a skull through the lens. So I freaked out and dropped it, <laughs> screaming out. So. You know, people have asked me, you know, uh, do you think this thing was huge? Do you think it was powerful? Do you think it could have killed you? And like I had mentioned before, yeah, I think, especially during the hanging, I felt like it could have killed me. That's right. 
As far as power, oh yes, it had power. There's, n there's no question about it. And I felt that in Weldon. That's where I really felt it when it knocked me out of that chair. It was like a massive force hitting me from the front, lifting me up out of a chair. If you can imagine me, imagine lifting me up a couple feet and then throwing me three feet behind my back against the trailer wall, rocking the trailer wall, because I felt the trailer wall give and I know, I know a wall and a trailer can give quite a bit anyway. But still, that takes quite a bit of force to bring you up out of a chair against a wall. And right then at that point, I felt the force of that thing. And I felt the power of it. And it was a guided power. It wasn't like it was some kind of electromagnetic energy, you know. I wish, I wish we'd have had this thing on tape. And if the camera wouldn't have failed on us, if the power wouldn't have been taken out of the camera, we'd have had this thing on tape. But you know, even if we'd have had it on tape, somebody would have accused us of rigging the thing, like they always do. There's just no way around that. They have to believe us. They have to believe this. It's true. Okay, one night Jeff and Barry came up and we were going to try a Ouija board se session, try to figure out why the ghost was following Jackie or why it was hanging around at all. And they came up and they set up their camera and we sat down at the Ouija board and some candles. And um, at first I had my hands on the pointer also with everyone else and Jackie was writing. And then um, the camera went dead. So we couldn't get anything off that. And the pointer was just flying across around everywhere. And the table started shaking and the candles started going out and I got too scared to touch it anymore. I was like, no. So I moved back against the wall in a chair, writing down whatever they were yelling out the little letters to me. I was writing it down, and um, Jeff slumped forward in his chair, and he, um, just for a couple seconds, he got back up, and he seemed to be okay. And then I think the um, entity or whatever spelled out his name, Then his chair came up off the ground and went flying back against the wall, and I didn't even like really bothered with what was going on at them. I just got up and ran out of there screaming. That night the Ouija board told us that this ghost was murdered and, and he was some kind of a fisherman or something. And it told us something about the baby, that it wanted to protect the baby from Jeff or something. I don't remember if we ever got anything from that, but it definitely did not like Jeff. It made that clear in the Ouija board session. And I told Jackie that I wasn't going to go back in the house. I was too scared. But I would keep the kids with me so they could go back. So they went back over there. And I kept the kids with me. And I took them in my bedroom and we all laid in my bed. And I had um, a cross that it had a, a small Christ on it that was nailed in with very tiny nails. And um, I've always believed in God. So I thought if anybody could protect me, that's who could. So right before I went to bed, I laid the cross right on my nightstand. And when I got up in the morning, the cross was laying right beside the, the Jesus had been taken off and laid beside it. So I took that over to um, and showed Barry it. And then when I was showing him, he was busy trying to film something. So I laid it down to show him when he was done. And when I came back, me and my friend Scott, we only found the cross and we couldn't find the Jesus part. And up between the kitchen and the living room in Jackie's room, she had some like raw iron little railing and it was up there hanging and I didn't even see it. I, I thought maybe it got knocked on the floor or something. Scott was the one that noticed that that's where it was. And it just, it really scared me. I was like, I don't know if it was trying to just show me that, you know, if it wanted to hurt me or whatever, nothing's going to save me, but it scared me <laughs> a lot. There's no question that whatever this was, had the power, and I'm sure it was a lot of poltergeist activity, so it moved a lot of objects, that's right, it did. It had electromagnetic energy. It must have had some kind of electrical energy because of the lights that we saw, but it also had some kind of intelligence because, as I mentioned before, you can't just take the lens off of a camera without knowing how to take it off. That really is a tip-off for the intelligence factor. Later that night, Barry and Jeff and Jackie went back to the house and they continued the Ouija board session. And 
from what I was told, it continued um, just spelling out all kinds of things all night long until the sun came up. It said, you know, that when the sun came up, it had to go. When the sun, sun came up, the camera started working fine, and it was gone. <laughs> I think Barry was very frustrated that he couldn't get it on film. You know, the camera equipment works when it's <laughs> really not needed, and then when it's needed to get, you know, really spectacular phenomenon, it doesn't work. <laughs> Jeff and Barry were not faking this in any way. I seen so much phenomenon when they were, you know, a four hour drive away that there's no way they could be faking it. There are 45 million Americans that have experienced some kind of poltergeist activity or some kind of type of ghost activity. So you know that there has to be something out there. Not all of them could be uh, creating lies. The things were too astonishing for anybody to fake. I mean, if you're walking down a hall and you see a red slash come up beside you, how is somebody going to fake that <laughs> without you seeing them? It, it would be impossible. And Barry did try to document it. Every time the camera would go out, he would try you know, to get it working. They'd try everything and check everything. They just couldn't get it working until whatever was controlling the camera let it go. And then it would work again. When the sun came up the next morning, the cameras worked fine. No problem. Like there had never been anything wrong with it. It's changed my life in a sense that I think differently about the universe as a whole, I think. I know that there's something else out there that uh, maybe when people die, they don't move all the way on to where they can actually move on. They can get kind of caught, let's say, in the, in the hallway. I always think of it like a hallway with like doors on either side, and somehow they don't make it to all the doors that they're supposed to. They get caught in the hallway. And those are the people that, that, that we experience when we go on these cases. It's actually, uh, I, I think that real people in, in life, when they're transferred on, still say, stay the way they are. They stay the, re they have the personality that they are. They don't change into something evil. Maybe if they were evil in life, they're going to be evil in, in that sense of the word too. They haven't quite moved on. After the seance, the haunting started to subside. The elderly person who continued to sing the gag inner visuals out appeared to be satisfied after he was allowed the opportunity to recount his story. The second ghost, the ball of light that Jackie believed to be the man named John Damon, was able to move on after a seance. In 1990, Jackie and her children moved back to Los Angeles where the spirit pulled a couple more paranormal things before they eased off. While visiting San Pedro, Jackie claims that one night she saw an orb of light take off from her old house and settle over the tombstone that read, John Damon. This orb of light went around and around the grave of John Damon. Barry Taft, the paranormal team who chipped away at the case for a couple of years, accepts that the spirit in the attic was probably the soul of a man named Herman Henderson, a 28-year-old man who was drowned in the San Pedro Sound in the 1930s. After he closed his examination, he noted that Jackie's stress probably added to the power of the unpleasant spirits. <laughs>